Have your Bibles tonight. Turn with me to the third chapter of the book of Romans. Verse 19 through the remainder of the chapter. Romans 3, verse 19 through the remaining part of the chapter. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned, Jew and Gentile, black and white, rich and poor. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being, there, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time His righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the uncircumcision by faith. Pardon, let me start over. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We ask you to help us. Give us understanding hearts and minds tonight. Help us to receive truth as you have it plainly spelled out before us tonight. We ask your help in this message. In Jesus' name, amen. Those of you that were in the service this morning at 8 o'clock, I spoke from a passage of Scripture that almost seems to contradict that. James says, faith without works is dead. I don't believe the Bible contradicts itself, do you? I believe there's a proper interpretation of Scripture. I do believe that. And when we properly interpret the Bible, it fits like a dovetail. This just dovetails together and fits so perfectly. It works out so well. But there are basically two camps in the Christian Western world. There are those people that believe that we're not under the law anymore. Therefore, we can do whatever we want to do. John Fletcher had a word for them. It's a great big word. It's called antinomians. These people are anti-law. They don't want anybody telling them what to do. They don't want any rules. And then there's that other camp that believes that there are certain parts of the law that we need to still abide by. Amen? Amen. I'm in that camp, just to let you know, in case you're wondering. I'm in that camp. And I'd like to try to break it down for you just a little bit tonight to make it a little more understandable. And I understand this is a deep theological subject, and they're still wrangling over it in the courts of theology somewhere. But I want you to know tonight, for us who are wanting to make our way to heaven, there's some important aspects to this. Paul said, shall we continue or shall we sin because we're not under the law? No, no, not at all. <clears throat> you know, if you have the law written in your heart, you really don't have to have it on tables of stone, do you? You really don't have to have it on the wall, even though I'm glad it's on the wall. Because by that law is the knowledge of what did he say? Sin. We come to understand we're sinners 
because we read that God says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And we know we don't have him number one on our, on our list when we're out there in sin. God's not number one in your life. Now, when you get saved real good and you love him with all your heart, guess who went to number one? God just elevated to number one spot in your life. And that means he's first in everything he wants you to do and everything you want to do for him, he's first. But tonight, I'd like to speak to you just a little bit and try to break it down as best I can. But, but when, the, when the New Testament talks about the law, it could be speaking to about five or six different things. One reference where it talks about the law is simply the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch. That's what it's called. Penta means five. Five books of Moses. It could be Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's the five books of Moses. It's referred to as the law. The Jews have, I think, and, I'm, and, and I could be corrected here because I'm not Jewish, but I think the Torah has not only the five books of Moses, but also some commentary in it. Is that right? I think that's true. So they could be referring to the, the Jewish Torah when they say the law. They could be referring to the sacrificial system that Moses instituted out there in the wilderness where it was taking an innocent animal and shedding that innocent animal's blood as an atonement for individual sins. The sacrificial laws where God ordained that if you sin, you were to bring a lamb or if you couldn't afford a lamb, bring a turtle dove. Bring something and let that, let that animal become your substitute and let its blood be shed and sprinkled on the altar and let that animal be burned uh, as a sacrifice for your sins. God instituted that system until the time would come when the perfect lamb would be slain once and for all. Those sacrifices, every one of them looked forward to Calvary. Every animal was looking forward to Calvary for the time that would come when Jesus Christ would give his life. So it could be the sacrificial laws, the animal sacrifice, the sin offerings, the wave offerings, the heave offerings, the first fruit offerings. There was a, a number of offerings by fire. So that's what we call the sacrificial laws. <clears throat> then there's the ceremonial laws. The seven major Jewish feasts were part of the ceremonial laws. The numerous washings, the numerous anointings, the numerous special days and special Sabbaths. And you read that in Colossians where he says, I'm a little worried about you and keeping of special days and Sabbaths. He's not talking about the weekly Sabbath. He's talking about these extra days that were in the Jewish ceremonial laws. Then they had the dietary laws. No pork chops. No bacon. Wow, I am glad I'm a New Testament Christian. BLTs are right up there at the top of my agenda. Amen? Right? But listen, bear with me. The, uh, the, the dietary laws, while you may think, what in the world did God care what they ate? Well, you live in a generation that's filled with microscopes, x-ray machines. We can see little bugs called germs now that they had no idea what made people sick. They had no idea that they needed to cook their meat till it was fully done to destroy the parasites. We understand that, don't we? Hope you do. I got a couple preacher friends that likes their steak really rare. I don't know about them. They haven't understood it yet. But, uh, you know, if that's the way you want to eat it, eat it. But uh, the, in the Old Testament, under the economy that these people were working under, they had no knowledge of disease or, or, or germs or parasites, the things that make people sick. And so God instituted a series of dietary plans and dietary restrictions that primarily was to protect them from getting sick. Amen? See, God does everything for a purpose, fellas. He doesn't just give rules just so he can show he's boss. Whenever God passes down an edict or a commandment or a principle or precept for us to live by, there is a definite purpose behind it. 
There's a reason for it. God is very reasonable. He's very kind and benevolent. And friend, when he puts up a, a guardrail in your life, thank God for it. And look at it as a guardrail. Don't look at it as a prison fence. Look at it as a guardrail. It's to keep you from going off that cliff over there. But uh, the Jewish ceremonial laws, the Jewish dietary laws, the Jewish hygiene laws. I mean, if they carried a dead body out to bury it, they were unclean until evening and couldn't come back into the camp until they took a bath and changed their clothes. Okay, no formaldehyde, hot climate. The body begins to deteriorate rather quickly because of what? Bacteria. You touch that dead body, guess what? You needed to wash. You needed to get that bacteria off you. In running water, you needed to do it. And God prescribed a set of hygiene plans that protected the Israelite people. And people that just read the Old Testament and look at all those, look at all these rules. Look at all these crazy restrictions. Friend, there's nothing crazy about any of them. They're all very legitimate and they're all very beneficial to the Jewish people. He said, I don't want you to have the same diseases that the people around you have. And what he did to protect them from those diseases was not only in a measure a supernatural shield at times, but he also gave them practical everyday things that would keep them from getting the bulk of what their neighbors had to suffer. Amen. So it's good practical stuff. But when the Bible says law, is it talking about the Torah? Is it talking about the Pentateuch? Is it talking about the sacrificial laws? Is it talking about the ceremonial laws and the feasts? Is it talking about the dietary laws or the hygiene laws? Or finally, is it talking about the moral law that's contained in the Old Testament? Wow. That many different kinds of law? Yeah. And it could be, depending on the context, it could be that he's referring to one specific part of it or he's referring to the entire system. But in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law. He didn't come to do away with it. Or the prophets didn't come to do away with them. I am come not to destroy but to fulfill. Did he fulfill the Mosaic five books? Did he fulfill every uh, messianic prophecy that Moses... And anyone within those five books gave on him? Even Balak's old backslidden prophecy. God gave him a prophecy. And it was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. I said Balak, it was Balaam. Caught my own mistake. Isn't that wonderful? I'm doing better if I can catch my own mistakes. Balaam, the guy the donkey talked to. Read that story in the Old Testament. It's interesting. But when God speaks through his word, the law, friend, is not void in our lives. Brother Ledger, I think, made the statement the other day, and it's very scriptural. It's what Paul said. I think it was Paul. He said the Old Testament testimonies, the Old Testament episodes are given for us for our admonition and our learning that we might see and and know how God dealt with his people back there. There's much benefit in the law of God. There's much benefit in the Old Testament. There's much benefit in the Pentateuch. And you and I are not here to destroy that law, but even though we as Christians are not justified by the keeping of those laws, we are justified by faith. But just because I'm justified by faith, do I cast out the moral law of God with it? No. Never, never. But I want to give you some, just a little bit of balance here and show you that some parts, Jesus fulfilled all of these categories, all six of them that I gave you. He fulfilled every one of them. The sacrificial, the ceremonial, the dietary. I mean, he kept every one of these laws perfectly. He was sinless. He was also Jewish. So he didn't have a BLT all the time he was here. He did not break over. He kept the laws perfectly. He was sinless. Okay, but just because he fulfilled them, some of them we, no need, we need no longer to practice, such as the sacrificial laws I've already told you. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 8 through 10. 
above when he said, Sacrifice and offering, and burnt offerings, and offerings for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, talking about the burnt offerings, he taketh away the first that he may establish the second, by the which will we are sanctified, not through the blood of bulls and goats or the ashes of a heifer. We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So those animal sacrifices, we don't need any of that. Your, your turtle dove is safe. If you have a pet lamb, it's safe. You don't need it anymore. It would be pointless for you to kill that lamb and sprinkle its blood somewhere and burn its body on an altar. So it would be pointless. There is no necessity. There's no need. That has been totally fulfilled. Completely. So I don't need the sacrificial laws according to Hebrews 10, 8 through 10. What about the ceremonial laws? Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink. This also applies to the dietary laws or in respect of a holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So Paul was telling them, you don't have to keep the ceremonial laws. You, you know, if you keep the Passover, that's okay, but you don't have to. You're under no obligation to keep these ceremonial rituals that they had been practicing for years that were peculiarly Jewish customs. No need. As far as the food is concerned, I've got good news for you. I have scripture for you that you can eat anything you want. The Bible says so in 1 Timothy 4, 3 through 5. He said there's some that are forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. You can eat whatever you want. Now, I was raised in West Virginia. We didn't have seafood. We weren't by the seashore. And there's a lot of these things that I look at on the menu at a seafood restaurant, and I wouldn't let them get anywhere near my mouth. They don't look like anything a man ought to eat. Okay, and that's just me now. If you like scallops and you like oysters and you like all that stuff, have at it. The Bible says you can eat anything you want. You want to eat snails? What's the fancy word for that stuff? It's escargot. So if you guys like me that don't know what escargot is, be sure if you go to a fancy restaurant and see that on you, don't order it. It's snails. I mean, you can pick them up under any, any waterlogged log. I mean... And it's a, it's a delicacy, I guess. But you can eat anything you want now. So the dietary laws and the ceremonial laws are fulfilled and abolished. They're done away with. God has fixed it so we can eat pork chops three times a day if you want. Okay? But cook it good. Still has trigonosis in it, maybe. What about the hygiene laws? Hebrews 9, 9 through 10. And he said, talking about the, the things that made the, the worshipers perfect, he said, there's not any of that thing could, could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of the Reformation, until the time of the change. Now the priest, even for the priest, he had to take a complete bath. It ain't a bad idea once a day. It ain't a bad idea. But before he could go into the temple, even if he wasn't dirty, he had to bathe himself completely. Put on brand new, clean, linen, priestly garments. He went in before God, and he had to maintain all these things. When the priests come, there was a wash basin out front. All of them had to wash their hands. There was, there was a continual process. And the Jews even picked on Jesus' group. He said, your crowd eats with unwashing hands. That was a serious offense for the Jews because one of the big things they majored on was cleanliness, which is all right because God instilled it in them. And there was a great purpose in it. But Jesus said, it's not what goes in the mouth that comes out. It's what comes 
out the mouth that defiles a man. Whoa. So if you eat with your hands dirty, you used to joke about it when we worked in the coal mines. There are no lavatories and washrooms in the coal mines. It's full of dust. It's full of dirt. It's either you're putting limestone dust on the coal to keep it from catching on fire, or you're covered with coal dust. You're either white as can be as a sheet from the rock dust, or you're as black as can be from the coal dust. And when it comes lunchtime, there is no bathroom to go wash your hands. So someone asked me one time when I was talking about this, so what do you guys do down there? I said, well, we get our sandwich out of our bucket and we hold it by the very corner. And we eat all the way around that sandwich. And I said, then we eat the corner. <laughs> dirt and all. Cold dirt and all. You know, that's, <clears throat> that's not the worst thing. My, my mom and grandmother said I used to sit in the coal pile we heated with coal in West Virginia back in the days before, you know, modern technology hit the world. And we had coal burning stoves, so we had a coal pile in the yard somewhere that we used for fuel. And they said I would go out there and munch on the coal. So that's the reason, that's the reason I am what I am, I guess. But you can eat anything you want. And if you don't want to wash your hands, I guess you don't have to. But it's still a good practice to wash your hands, okay? But the ceremonial laws, the hygiene laws, the sacrificial laws, they're all met in Christ. But there's one more major section that's not going away. It's not done away with. That's what he said here. Do we make void the law through faith? No. We establish the law. We give it validity. We, we, we obey it because it's part of us now. The law of God is now part of me. It's been written on the fleshly table of my heart. I don't want to do those things that there's the Ten Commandments over here. I don't want to break God's law. I don't want to do anything on the Sabbath. I don't want to do anything uh, as far as having a graven image of God or any kind of idol to bow down to. I refuse. I don't want that. But it's not because it's on the wall and it's not because I have actually stone. Uh, replicas with it engraved with them. I actually have stone tablets of the Ten Commandments in my possession somewhere in that trailer. But it's not because I have them in the trailer that I don't do those things. It's because Jesus put something by faith in my heart. I didn't get right with God by doing those things because I couldn't do those things without God. You can't keep the first commandment without God. You will not put him first until you make him first in your heart and let him come in and change you. You can't keep the very first commandment. When it says love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, try it without grace. <laughs> See how far you get without grace in your heart. You won't get anywhere. But those commandments are there to awaken the sinner to his need, but they're also there to protect human society from total corruption. Let's just say we take away the laws that deal with murder. And it's okay to kill anybody you want to kill. I think some people have that mentality already. Some have already come to that conclusion. It's not the case. Could you imagine what our... It would, it would be like Chicago huh? around here. It would be like Detroit. Some of these other great democratic strongholds, excuse me where guns are outlawed, and only the outlaws have guns. But listen, listen. It's still against God's law to take innocent life. Murderers do not have eternal life abiding in them. They're not going to heaven. Now murderers can repent, thank God. If you have time and opportunity and the grace of God deals with you, you can repent of all these sins. But if you're committing those sins when you live, and you check out here without getting right with God, you're not going to heaven, according to my Bible. According to my Bible, and I can prove it to you. But the moral laws of God are part of God's nature because he's moral, he's holy. And he understands that society needs certain structural elements to keep it within civilized boundaries. So when God ordained the Ten Commandments 
And some would say, preacher, there's nothing in the New Testament that tells me I have to keep the Ten Commandments. I beg to differ with you. In fact, I have a, a, a verse in mind that I'm going to read to you that I believe that Jesus himself made it a condition of being one of his disciples. That verse is found in Matthew chapter 19, verses 17 through 19. The rich young ruler, the guy, the great guy, kept all these commandments from his youth up. You remember the guy? Came, bowed down to Jesus, paid proper respect to him. He, he called him master. He, he done everything proper. He was coming with the right attitude. He was coming with the right question. What can I do to have eternal life, it says. And Jesus said, if thou will enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, which? Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, and honor thy father and thy mother. That's five of the ten that's on that board. Which means he didn't leave the other five out, he just didn't go to the trouble of naming all ten of them. And so therefore, friends, on the authority of God's word, it is incumbent upon Christians to obey the moral law of God. Amen? This is good preaching, Brother Hatfield, good teaching. Because we have come to the point that we are basically antinomian. We don't want to do what's right, but God is calling us to a life of righteousness, a life of holiness. And friend, you don't break those laws and be holy. You don't break those laws and be righteous. So whether he actually commanded you to keep them or not, it's become a part of us because God, who instilled those laws and ordained those laws, is now living within our heart. It's compatible with his nature. It's compatible with who he is. So when you think about this matter of the law, the Torah, the five books of Moses, the animal sacrificial system, the ceremonial laws, the hygiene laws, the dietary laws. Everything has been completely fulfilled with the exception. And he did fulfill the moral law as well by being sinless. By obeying the commands, he fulfilled all the law. But he has satisfied everything else until we don't need to bother with it. And the New Testament has made it clear there's been a transition from the old to the new. And, like I say, it's a lot less restrictive in some ways. Every Jewish male had to go to Jerusalem. I don't care where you lived in Israel. It was required three feasts out of the year. You were required to leave your home and job and go to Jerusalem and offer a sacrifice to the Lord. That was part of the ceremonial ritualistic system that they had. Every male was required to go. That's why Joseph and Mary took Jesus when he was 12 to Jerusalem for the Passover. It was, it was required attendance. It was mandatory. <laughs> mandatory church back in the Old Testament. Think of it. And Jesus went and his family went and they worshiped and they did what they were required to do and offer a lamb and offer an animal for a sacrifice for their sins. And God took that as payment until Jesus came along and stamped the debt, paid in full. It's a beautiful story, friend, and it dovetails perfectly together. There is no enmity between obedience to God's law and faith. There is no enmity between that. There's no enmity between works and faith. We don't work to get saved. We work because we are saved. We do good and obey Him because we are Christians, not to become Christians. And that's where all the difference is. And I'm going to give you in a little secret, I think, of why Paul wrote the way he wrote and why James wrote the way he wrote is because Paul was constantly in battling the Judaizers, which wanted to bring everybody back under circumcision. They wanted to bring them back under these, all of these stringent restrictions. And Paul said, we don't need to do that. And so Paul continually hammered on the matter that justification is by faith 
and that we get saved by faith and we don't have to be circumcised. We don't have to offer a lamb. We don't have to go back to all those Jewish things. But he never once, in fact, over and over, he repeated that we still keep the law of the moral law of God. We keep the things that make God who he is and make society what it should be. So I don't know if that muddied the water or cleared up anything for you. But there's two camps, and you're going to fall into it. And you're going to hear it preached. And a lot of the big mega preachers, radio and television preachers, they're going to tell you that the law is of no avail to you if you're a Christian. Well, it serves at least two great purposes. One is it convicts us of our sin. If we go astray, the law tells us you shall not. And we know where to go back and straighten up. The other great thing it does is it keeps us within the moral boundaries that God has set for humanity. And I think everybody ought to live under those Ten Commandments myself. What a more blessed place it would be. I mean, if everybody would stick with his own wife, just think how many homes won't be destroyed this year by adultery. Just think how many children won't be left without a mom or dad if everybody just keep the Seventh Commandment. Just stick with your own wife. Stick with your own husband. What a better world it would be. But uh, I don't know. Again, I I just felt like I'd try to clear this up for you. And I hope I haven't muddied the waters. Let's stand. Father, we thank you tonight for the privilege to be in church on a Wednesday evening. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for truth. We thank you, Lord, for light. Thank you for understanding of the holy tonight. We ask you, Lord, to help us to maintain our balance, maintain our balance, Lord, between faith and works. Because, Lord, the first thing you asked those seven churches or the first thing you told them was, I know your works. (laughs) I know what you're doing. Some of them he reproved and some of them he applauded but he knows what we're doing. And Lord, we want our works to be acceptable to God. We want our lives to be acceptable to God. And we do not believe in any form or fashion that we can break the Ten Commandments or the moral law of God and be pleasing to you. We ask you to help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.